Good morning. Um, and, and I often get asked to talk in the morning of the second day because I have a loud voice, apparently. So wake up! Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, my world, which is a world of design and a world of experience design. And we are a misunderstood group, a bit like developers, because the work that we do is often seen to be incredibly fluffy and have no great impact on the world because it's all about pictures. So I'm going to talk to you today about why the intersection of design and development are so important and why we need to work better as communities. But I'm also going to talk about why the practice that I've been following and has been part of a growing practice in the same way that yours is, has been changing and shaping and evolving. And I'm probably going to ask you to sit into places that, that maybe feel a little strange, um, which is what we do in design. Um, so I think there's a lot of mystery. So where I worked previously at a big bank, we used to talk about a spectrum of fluffy to meaty. And we, when we were doing things badly, we were sitting at the fluffy end of the spectrum. And when we grew up, we wanted to aspire to be meaty. And we always saw the developers, the BI people, they were always meaty. And our mission was to try and move design up the spectrum from fluffy to meaty, which is what I've spent the last few years doing. And this feels really ringy to me. Is it ringy to you? Yeah, OK. I'll try and move it. So let's start with something really simple which is the fundamental composition of things. So you start with websites, but I'd like you to think about the components of a chair. And I've had some arguments about this with people who are very deficient. But <laughs> they told me that a chair could have one leg. I'm like, no way. But apparently a chair can have one leg. They told me a chair could have no back. I fundamentally disagree that a chair can have no back, because then it's a stool. But there are some components that chairs have to have. They have to have, let's agree, legs. And they have to have a back. I maintain they have to have a back. And that is the fundamental composition of a chair. Nothing really rocket science about that. When we get into design space and we get into the, the real design space, the true parts of what we do are the parts that we cannot change. So they're the parts that the business comes back to us with and says things like, we've got this data, we want to act on this insight. And the true parts are fundamental. So I work in the health insurance industry, boost, just as bad as banking, but it's quite fun. But one of the interesting things about the true parts of what we do is that the data that we have, if we applied it properly, could save us 300 billion a year. And one of the biggest problems that we have in healthcare is that there are fundamental wastes of money in the process, and it's one of the most inefficient systems we run. So the true is really important, the component parts of what we do. So if we want to move design towards meaty, we know we have to work with the true space. The real is the bit that you're sitting in now. You're sitting in a chair. It's a kind of fold-down chair. It's probably a little bit comfortable. It's designed for the context. It's designed for the place in which you're using it. If you apply this to the way that we do design, you start thinking about looking around you. Is it mobile? Is it tablet? Is it website? What are the people going to do? What does that chair feel like? It's probably not rocking your world, but it's not a bad chair. It has some components. It's kind of gray, soft-ish. It folds down, has arms, definitely has a back. Um, and this is the components of the real part of this chair. And in design, real is often the bit where we start to really screw things up. So true is OK. John Maeder, who's one of my hero designers, John Maeder has done a, a bunch of work with Apple. He's done some work with, with um, the design of terminals. He talks a lot about the early parts of his career being around complexity. And if you look at some of the, the, the poorer end of the stuff that we design, it's usually in that complexity space. And complexity is what we find in things like Mikey. So the real space is important to us because it's about your context. But it's often the space where we do things worse and we start to design things badly. Then there's the chair. Close your eyes for a minute and think about your favorite chair. This is the one that you go home to. You curl up in, usually take your shoes off in, and it will be different for all of you. This is the chair that absolutely aligns with where you want to be. This is it. It's comfy. It's big enough to curl up in. You might have a back that goes back. My kids are fighting me at the moment for a lazy boy. I absolutely refuse to have a lazy boy because it doesn't fit with my design um, mindset. They tell me that they're deprived now for life because they've never been allowed to have a, a, a lazy boy. And now when they go to places with lazy boys, they make great effort to tell me how much they want one. But the ideal is the space where we often want to be. And the process of design is about taking what's true, looking around at what's real, and turning it into what's ideal. And that's the space where we often forget to have the courage to do things. And this is where I need you. Because we can't build what's ideal unless we start to build conversations around what's true, what's real, and where we could be. And the ideal space is where the really fun stuff happens. 
We have a few problems, though, because we're humans. And designing for ideal is that we tend to get lost into this space where we start to think that we know everything. So this is one of my favorite. There's a thing, uh, Andrew Goodsman came up with a thing called the Malkovich bias, which is the bit where we, we call it the uncle syndrome, to quietly. But it's the, oh, yeah, well, of course everyone does this like this, because that's the way people do things, don't they? I once had a banker tell me, um, he, said, he said, well, everyone knows what time their direct debits go out in the morning. I said, really? <laughs> I, he said, well, of course you do. Like, what else would you know? Like, why would you not know? And I said, well, I don't even know what day my direct debits go out. And he goes, well, like, how do you survive? And I said, well, <laughs> easy. He said, how do you make sure there's enough, not enough money in your account? And I go, it's kind of this random process that happens where usually there's enough money, and when there isn't, I get a rude letter from you guys, and I make sure there is. <laughs> and he looked at me with utter disbelief, and he was like, I couldn't live like that. And, and, and this is a, a perfect example of the Malkovich bias. If you looked at the front of your phones, everybody's phones are set up wrong. I get teased for having like 31 calendar reminders that I haven't answered and 17 messages. And it looks like I don't really care about my messages, but I do, because the ones I'm ignoring, I've already scanned and read. But everybody's technology is different. Everybody's ideal is different. This, I would say, is my real, not my ideal. I have this aspirational need to make my phone be beautiful and simple and clear. And one day when I'm grown up, I'm going to have this wonderful life. But one of the things that we forget in design is that we spend a lot of time asking people. So you might take your site and you might say to people, you know, what do you think about this site? And they'll say, that's great. And you might show me a tool that will help me clean up my front page of my um, iPhone. And I might say, that's fantastic. But the gap between making me do that and the behavior change it's going to take to make me go from what is real to what is ideal is the really interesting space and the space where we can really work as a community together to make changes. So for example, when I came to sign up for Drupal South, I did have a bit of a problem. I ended up with eight tickets in my basket because I couldn't work out what was happening and I couldn't see the feedback. Now, that's a problem that we all have with websites. I mean, my, our website, Medibank Private, it has its issues. We're working on it. We're trying to make it better. All I'm saying is let's be conscious when we look at the technology that we have and when we're deeply buried in the beauty of it that it actually might not work. And it really isn't that hard to go and ask people to show you stuff. So we talk about, um, in, in my field, we talk a lot about generative feedback. If I ask you whether you like something, there is an absolute bias within the way that you are made to tell me that you do. As human beings, unless we're largely dysfunctional, it's very hard to tell somebody who's asking you about their work and say, actually, it sucks. So people will say things like, yeah, yeah, that, that'd be a really good idea. Yeah, yeah. I reckon that my friend would be really into that. And w at the moment we hear things like that, we go, hmm, OK. So we never ask people, do we like it? We say, show us an example. So we were doing some testing last week with Facebook. And when people said to us, oh, I've never put my health information into Facebook. And we all went, yeah, I know. Who do that? And they went, you know, I've never put private information into Facebook. And we all went, yeah, I know. Who do that? And then we asked them to do some stuff which involved them actually putting a phone number into Facebook. And they all did it. 99% of them did it. We went back and we said, so you just put your, Facebook, your phone number into Facebook. And they went, yeah. But you know, like it's not, that's not really private. And it's, it's, it was in a, a special page. And they all had a good reason to do it. And that's why we use generative feedback. Because that gap between real and ideal is really fundamentally different. There, there was an experiment run in the UK, and they did a, a series of tests. They brought 100 people in, and they got them to sit an exam. And they were told at the end of the exam that they could have a prize. And they, were said, they said, well, they have the prize, and you've got to come back five days later to pick up the prize. And the prize was either a big basket of fruit or a massive basket of chocolate. And, 86% of people said, oh, the fruit would be so good. I'll go with the fruit. And they came back a week later, and they were given the option to change. They said, look, you know, people do change their minds. And they'll be, oh, no. Um, would you like to change? And of that 86%, 75% of them took the chocolate. And that's because our view of our ideal selves and our view of our real selves are very different. So when we design stuff for people, we have to be designing for what people are really like. So... Design thinking has become a bit of a buzzword. It's become the new innovation, which we try to avoid it a little bit. But um, all it is, effectively, is not secret source, which some of the big consultancies are trying to sell it as. Everybody can download a design methodology off the website. Anyone can download this thing that says all you do to do design is you analyze and research, you prototype, 
you design some more and then you validate. And we go, yeah. And I put this a little bit like an accountant coming to me and the accountant could say to me, you know, I'm going to give you a simple methodology to help you be an accountant. I'd be like, yes. So what you have to do is you have to get a spreadsheet. Got one of them? I'm like, yeah, got a spreadsheet. And then you need to put some numbers into it. Okay, okay? Yeah, here's the numbers. Then you need to add the numbers up. Got it. And then you need to um, tell me whether or not the numbers are right. How do I know they're right? Well, are they in the spreadsheet? Yeah, yeah they're there. Are they telling the right story? I have absolutely no idea because I'm not an accountant. So a design methodology doesn't make you a designer. So I want to talk you through some of those things that, if you look at Excel, Excel is in the true space. Works, has boxes, does the job it's meant to do. It's hardly going to rock your world. I bet you don't sit there on Friday night playing with Excel. Your calendar is in the real space. Helps you organize your life. The nicer the calendar, the better the calendar, the more likely you are to use it well. It's OK. A calendar's a good thing. And then there are the tools that we kind of love. I don't know how many of you have tried Carrot. Have you tried Carrot? Carrot is a task app. And it starts off and it greets you as a lazy human. It says, greetings, lazy human. <laughs> uh, and then if you don't slack into it, it tells you that you've been slacking for 13 days. It gives you really rude messages. And if you poke it, it tells you to stop poking it. And it's quite fun except when it's really rude to you. And, it's like, and then it'll tell you, and it'll tell you this, this has been on your task list forever, and it gives you little chastisements, and you can publish them, and it asks you, it says, if you publish this on Facebook, we'll take, we'll actually, you know, if you publish your, your, your shaming on Facebook, then we'll actually um, take, give you some points back. And so, my <laughs> so I gave this to my 10-year-old. She was like, oh, this is really fun. She actually was playing last night with um, Carrot for an hour and a half, and she was playing with it. She says to me, Mum, I've got you to level 16. And I said, I didn't even have level 16. What do you mean? And she said, oh, if you keep telling it things, she says, look, I've just done this. I put in these tasks, and then I cross them off really fast, and then it gives me rewards. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, show me that. So then she said, and this bit's really cool, she said, because it's given me some points, and I can trade those points off for the tasks that I haven't done. And I'm going, how did you work that out? And she said, oh, I don't know, but it was funny when it was rude to me, so I kept going. <laughs> so... This, was a sort of, this is the example of what I'm talking about as ideal. So, and only by working with my 10-year-old did I discover that it actually did this, because I'm probably more in, in the other space. This is another one of its, um, its messages to you. So everyone knows about user tasks. Everyone knows about user stories. Everybody knows about thinking of users first. We all know about business tasks. But there's a lot of mystery being about user tasks. I've seen lots and lots of spreadsheets full of things like, as a user, I need to um, enter my password into a, f into a form. It's like, really? As a user, I need to not even think about my password. So when we do user tasks, we do a lot of thinking about what is it actually that somebody's trying to get done? Because we spend a lot of time framing a user task in the language of the, the, the context that we use. If I'm a business person, it will be about business language. I had someone tell me yesterday that users really needed to sign up for private health insurance. I'm like, really? I don't think that's what they're trying to do. I think they're trying to do something and get it done really, really fast because it sucks having buying health insurance. So a lot of time is about getting ourselves to pedal back and state those problems well. So design uses questions. We talk about how might we questions. And the question might be as simple as, how might I buy a ticket really, really easily? Or how might I sign up for a form? Or how might I not have to remember a password? It's not the answering of the question that's hard. It's the stating of the problem that's hard. And we often are so quick to get into the solution that we forget to stop and say, is that the right question? Turns out that sometimes a website's not about what a website's about. It's something totally different. And the reason why Carrot is successful is because the purpose of Carrot is not to do tasks, because I hate doing tasks. The purpose of Carrot is to make me laugh enough and keep me coming back often enough that I remember to do my tasks. And if I'd stopped and framed that question, then this is what you get, not an Excel spreadsheet. And when you poke that red thing, by the way, it tells you to stop poking it, and it tells you it gets really annoyed, and then the screen goes black, and all your tasks fall off. So, but the only other thing is that design had this little bit of a thing where we tried to be grown up, and we tried to really make it kind of cool and sexy to do design, and we said that design was the most important thing in the whole dev process, and that really sucked too, because then we became just another shouting group like anybody else. Because we really do need the business tasks, and we really do need business people, and we really do need developers, and we really do need designers. And 
Just as it's hard for us to ask questions about the right thing to build, it's hard for the business to frame the right thing to build. So what we're doing at Medibank is we're building what we call a design practice, not a lab, not an incubator, but an actual place where questions get formed across the business. And what we're doing is we're bringing together people from across product, service, call centers, tech, IT, money, finance, and we bring them together in a room and we say, okay, the business needs to, I don't know, have 500 people sign up for this product by next week. What might we do together? And the actual process of going through that and deciding what are the priorities, what are the constraints, and what are we actually trying to do for tasks? What is it that people want to get done? have really changed the way that we work. And they've changed the kind of conversations that we have. And they've helped our devs to work better. And they're helping our designers to work better. And they're helping our products to work better. Some of you might have seen um, a product that we launched, um, Gym Better, which was a, an app that allows you to go to the gym. Um, um, without having to sign up. Now, we did this before we had this process. And as a result, we missed things like the fact that we had iBeacons in our stores, but not iBeacons in our gyms. We, we've lost the connection points. So what we somehow need to do in terms of value is to find the really cool spot between that. And what we're starting to do, some of, I don't know if some of you have seen um, a process called um, core model or core page design. And what we do is we take our content and we take our business questions and we take our our ideas and we nail them down. This is not our process, we didn't invent it. It's, it's um, Ari Hallen's process, but it's really, really useful. And you decide what are the core pages, what are these things that people are trying to do. And you do that before you design a menu, and you do it before you design any kind of navigation. And what you end up with is a series of stuff. And you say, okay, we need somewhere where people can sign up, and we need somewhere where people can buy things, and we need somewhere where people can get information. And we start off with a set of core stuff. We don't even fill these in. We just go, what are our core pages? Are we sure they're the right pages? Are they meeting business needs? Do we have the right content? What's the fluffy content we don't need? And what's the content we do need? And once we've got that core page, then we start to go, right, OK, does that meet the two goals at the top? I can sign up for the product, and I can get my health insurance easy. Then we start to go, right, OK, how do you get in and how do you get out? So rather than saying, what is the menu, and then what goes in the different menu pages, we start from the center of the web page and build out. And we say, often what happens is we don't think about what's inward and what's forward. Because these days, people don't land on a home page. Like, I think the stats are that it's, it's dropped, landing on home pages dropped by like over 50% in the last two years. Um, and home pages are where we normally start. Using this approach, we start with our core pages, <coughs> And then we start to be able to understand how do you get in and how do you get out. So it might be that you get in through Google. It might be you get in through a random page embedded in somebody else's website. And even more importantly, where do you want to go afterwards? Because that takes us from true. So true is the middle bit. Real is how do I get in? And ideal is I can get in and out quickly doing the stuff that I want to do. So it's not rocket science. It's just a simple design process that structures the questions in the room. And what we find is when we bring together lawyers and risk people and IT people and tech people, we can do this. It allows us to have conversations about what really is core. And it allows us to have the conversations that enable us to build well. Because doing design really kind of sucks sometimes. One of the things that happens in businesses is everything needs to have a, a box, a form, a feasibility document. You know it. You've seen it, you know, the task list, the sign-off, the, 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 the UAT, the this form, the that form. And we get so stuck in the forms that we forget about inventing stuff that's really ideal. And it feels really uncomfortable to be in this space. One of the reasons we built a design practice is because sitting in that squiggly bit feels really like you suck. It's the bit where we talk about it in other ways. We say that there is the, um, the dream moment. The project's got funding. We're going to do it. It's going to be fantastic. Oh, my God, this is so good. The money's in. Let's go have some champagne. And then there's the, the, the beginning bit. Everyone's full of excitement. You start off, and then you hit what we call the zone of despair, where nothing is going to come together. Everything's going wrong. Everyone starts arguing with each other. You've got some tension. Things are happening. People want it blue, pink, green, yellow. And, and, and you're in that space. And often at that space, someone goes, oh, this is never going to work. Let's just get on with it, and, and, and let's get finished. And I would argue that we move too quickly through that, because if you can have a, a capability in your teams or in, in the way that you work, to allow you to sit in that space for a bit. 99.9% .9 of the time, you emerge from it with a massive sense of elation. And it usually happens around 4 AM, at the point when you've eaten too much pizza and you're sitting around going, this is just absolutely sucks. We're all going to get fired. And somebody will go, what if we did? And you go, oh my god. 
why didn't we think of that three weeks ago? But that doesn't happen by accident. That happens through the nurturing and the comfort that says, when we hit this messy space, we're okay with that. This is what happens. And don't panic. Don't stress. I mean, if it's still going on six, seven weeks later, then you've probably got a problem. But, but generally, it's normal for it to feel like it sucks. And, and that's okay. And a lot of my work now is about working with creative teams or cross-functional teams and making it okay for that to happen. And I would say it's just the same as home. If you think about you know, the, the, the moment you, know, so you get up in the morning and you sort of think, oh my God, how am I going to make all this happen? And some of it will work and some of it won't. And I got home last night and I looked around my house and, and there was stuff, I think, on every single surface. I think there was paper and stuff and then there was my kids' shoes and there was stuff. And I looked around and I was like, oh my God. Before I can even eat, I have to deal with this. And I thought, maybe I don't. Maybe we could just get pizza. And maybe we could just clear a hole that big. And we could sit in the hole that big and eat pizza. And so we did. And that is what that messy space is. It's about not, it's okay when it doesn't all go right. My kids thought it was great. They were like, oh, this is like camping. <laughs> um, so the words that we're starting to use is not design or not delivery, not development, not art, not creativity, not front end, back end, but valuable exchanges. And that's the human side of what we're trying to do. And we're saying, if we get it right, if we go, what's the user needs, what's the business needs, what's the essential content, and what's the core? And we apply over the top of it this ability to be messy and creative in the way that we work. Then what we're building is a valuable exchange at every point. So instead of saying, does this meet user needs, or does it meet the, we draw a circle and we go, OK, of all the people who might be using this thing, who's getting value out of it? And if there is one point in that circle, and for us it's shareholders, stakeholders, customers, providers in hospital, physios. If, if we can't demonstrate value at every one of those points, then we got something wrong. We have to go back to that core. Because if I just deliver something to one point of that value exchange, then it's not much point in doing it. It's just going to be another bit of fluff in the, the journey. And that's how you get you know, multi-page websites that you can't find your way around. So, in my field, there's a lot of stuff happening. I don't know how many of you have seen this. This is um, Guevara, which is a, um, there's been a big um, revolution in, in insurance and banking in the UK in particular. So the UK government has been investing a massive amount of money into um, financial tech in the UK. So they built incubator spaces. They launched the, uh, the finance policy for the UK government in an incubator space in Canary Wharf. Um, they've put in place legislation that says if a bank won't give you a loan, they have to refer you on to crowdsource funding opportunities. So there's been a big shift. And so what you've started to get is things like Guevara, which have said, what is it someone's trying to do? Someone is not trying to buy insurance. Someone's trying to make sure that they're safe when they purchase an insurance product. And what this does is you simply work with either your friends, your family, or a group of people. And you agree together that you're all reasonably safe drivers, and you're going to crowdfund your insurance together. And you agree to a level that they, they, they put in parameters, and it's underwritten by an insurance company. But effectively, you all have modern cars. You all don't drive very much. They'll insure you for this amount. You pull that money, and you create an excess amongst the crowdfunded pool. If you then don't draw against that pool, that money gets supplied against your premiums the next year, so you pay less. So it's in your interest to pull together with people who drive carefully. Because effectively, what you're doing is lowering your premiums year on year. Um, obviously, we can't do that in health insurance, because it would kind of suck if you said, we said, your friends are going to hate you for being sick. <laughs> you're a loser. No one's going to want to be your friend. So we can't do that exactly. But what we're interested in is the fact that it starts off with a need. And that need is not, I want to buy insurance. That need is, how might I pay less for my insurance? And what might I do? So this has been hugely successful. They're happening. They're doing the same sort of thing across, um, um, across Germany. They're doing it with financial insurance and the like. So what I'd argue is that when we look at true business needs, real user needs, and absolutely amazing stuff, it's in that intersection point. And it's about connections. And there was some research done in um, MIT. They were trying to look at how really successful companies worked and how really successful organizations worked. And what they found was, we used to think it was about people that we call idea scouts, the sort of people who go out and they read funky magazines and they find great stuff and they come back in and they go, oh my god, we need a thing like this. Imagine if we did the health insurance of, I don't know, I can't think of anything cool. The health insurance of something amazing. Turns out, 
that those people actually are important, but not very important. The more important people are these people called connectors. And you all know them. And as a dev community, and, and I, I'm not a developer, but I have worked with lots of dev communities, connection is something we do internally, but not so well externally. And idea connectors are the people who do really, really great stuff with your ideas. They're usually people who have conversations with everybody. They might know what the, where the cleaning lady's going on holiday. They might know what Bob on level 32 is, what kind of new shoes he's buying. But in the process of all those conversations and all that talking, they're also discovering really important information about needs, about what's going on, about what people are doing, what things. And these idea connectors, they take the ideas from the idea scouts and they make them go to the right places. And the same is true of building really good pages. So we all got to this page where we built wireframes and that was great, and now we've built wireframes, we're all cool. But what I would say is those wireframes are idea scouts. They're a bunch of good ideas on a page, but they're not effectively connected to the rest of the site. And the reason we use core page modeling is because what we're trying to do is to build those connections in so that that flows well. And we really keep asking why. So there's the, the five whys, the four whys, whichever ones you want to use. I don't think I can come up with seven. But what we do is we apply that all the time. If we can't answer why, and we've got to round three, then we need to go back and do it again. And just having a wireframe is not going to help to ask those questions. As it says, it will tell us where we put something, but it won't say why. So we have a whole bunch of toolkits and pictures and things that we do. And we remind people to think about people. So there's a, I'm sure most of you work with personas and the like, and there's a lot of secret source stuff about personas. You know, oh, our personas are better, and we have these special personas, and it's taken us a good six months to make our personas. Personas are just a thing to stop you thinking about you. But what we do is we'll take these personas through, and we'll go and we'll ask the persona. If we haven't got any money for testing, we'll use a persona. And we'll go through, and, and we had this example yesterday. It was... Um, I think it was a seven point sign up for something. And we were going, what's going to happen to this guy if we make him go through these things? And they were going, well, he's going to start off and he's going to go into the page. And they're going, yeah, and then he'll click next. And we're going, yeah, really? You reckon? How do we know that? Oh, well, because he will. Sure. And that was the first point where it broke down. And because we had a persona on, because we asked the question, we could go back and we could go, well, well, actually, there's probably only about a 2% chance at this point of him clicking next. So what can we do? Well, let's not make an X button at all. OK, gone. And that's the way that we use these. And sometimes we create funky looking things, and sometimes we create pictures for people, and sometimes we create storyboards and journey maps. And it really depends. All of these tools are our tools. They're more for the people consuming them to make the right decisions than they are for us. A lot of it's about bringing people along on a story. So I've just employed a graphic designer in my team with the pure focus of telling stories. All she has to do is make my stuff look funky. And I learned this working in NAB a few years ago um, because we would say, oh, we're service designers. We design the way products and services work together. And people will come and say, could you make our PowerPoint look good? And we go, man, we're not graphic designers. And then we did one for somebody and we made their PowerPoint and they, they, they said, oh, this team funkified my PowerPoint for me. And we became known as the funkifiers of PowerPoints. And half my team were going like, they're going, oh, this absolutely sucks. I so didn't want to sign up for this. But then what we noticed was as we funkified people's PowerPoints, our PowerPoints got shown to lots more people because everyone went, ah, you've got to use my slides. <laughs> my slides are great. And they would appear at Exco and they'd appear on walls. And then we started to get people coming to us and they'd say, oh, I want one of those things like I saw on level seven with the colors and the, and we go, why do you want one? He said, because every time the EGM walks past that, he goes, wow, that looks great, guys. And we realized that the, the, the design of visual artifacts was a key for us to have conversations with business people that didn't understand what it was that we did. So instead of trying to talk to them about wireframes and instead of trying to talk to them about page flows and user journeys and task flows and design patterns, we talked to them about stories. So I think we all know this. We all think about it. But we were talking the other day about the fact that the, the blue dot has actually fundamentally transformed our lives. I can't think of a time what now without the blue dot. I think I'd probably go into a state of absolute panic if I had to navigate my way through my world without a blue dot. And yet I did. My daughter found a, a box of maps the other day, and she said, what are these for? I said, they're, they're for finding your way around. Aren't they cool? And she's going, what? People really used to walk around with paper out like that. And I was going, yeah. She's going, oh, that's so funny. And, <laughs> and I was thinking about it, and I thought, yeah, it is, isn't it? Like, imagine 
I, we did. We used to stand on street corners and look at, at pieces of paper. And she said, why didn't they just take a photograph of it? And I said, well, you couldn't kind of, because you had to, you know. She's like, what? Like, you couldn't just take the photograph and then put it on your phone. And I was like, no. And she was like, what? That is so... And she said, went and told my son. She was like, guess what? People used to walk around with maps and paper and stuff like that, and they couldn't even take photos. And I listened to this conversation, and I thought, we think about purposeful systems, but we forget. And that's where you have to go back to true and real and ideal. So what is true? True is that now we do have a blue dot. So the systems that we can design allow us to integrate that blue dot and connect that blue dot into the way that we navigate. Because we now have a blue dot, real means that we can actually connect things together in different ways. And because we have a blue dot, I don't get lost anymore. That's my ideal. I do still have some issues with the whole like upside down thing and the right and left thing, but that's OK. I'm working on it. But we need to really think about purposeful systems. So what we do after we go through that core page task is we move back to the next bit. Because a lot of design and the complex design that happens in that space is when we actually fall in love with features and we forget to leave things out. And it takes as much courage to leave something out as it does to put it in. So what we do is after we've done those page flows and those core pages, often we end up with these quite busy pages. And then we say to people, right, OK, you're actually designing for mobile. So you can only have three pieces of content on the page. You can have more if you like. It's just going to be a really long page. And then it gets really tricky, because then you have to negotiate. And you have to say, OK, what three pieces of content into what forward paths? So we have the same inward paths, but our job is to keep people moving through those paths in content. And that bit gets really heated, and that bit gets really complicated. And it's also where the best of the messy thinking happens. Because while we know something's core, this is taking it to the next. It's like the core core. It's kind of once you start to kind of eat right into the apple core rather than just make it a nice shape. And making design judgments is the purpose of the design practice in our organization. So what we're trying to do is to help people and give people the tools to decide when it is. So we have a series of what we call experience design principles. And they say things like, my t uh, I want Medibank to treat my time as precious. So we'll go back to that core page and we'll go, OK, is that helping someone? Have make, are we helping them feel their time is precious? It's like, well, no, because they're going to have to take a photocopy into the year and get it signed. And OK, that's out then. And that helps us make design decisions and judgment decisions. And it helps us realize that we're not there yet. And it helps stop us falling in love with the pieces. And that's when sometimes our legal people will turn around and go, but you can't do that there. It absolutely has to go somewhere else, because we can't have that conversation until that's happened. And that's where that collaborative working helps us make really strong decisions and go, yep, yeah, no, maybe, and out. And it's where arguments happen, and people get upset because their favorite feature gets dumped. But effectively, it helps us make better decisions. We've also stopped talking about minimal viable products, because what I've discovered is that minimal viable product in most places means the thing you started off thinking about with all the stuff added on. And it just means that you do the minimal viable product, plus all the other stuff, faster. And what you end up with is a kind of half-built thing that kind of works, which isn't bad but it's never really a minimal viable product. So what we started doing is talking about actions, a minimal viable actions. And we got this a lot from, we looked a lot into behavior change. So there was an experiment run in the UK tax office. They had high tax payers. They had um, $32 billion of unpaid taxes from people who were very wealthy, but who weren't paying them. And they'd sent them lots of letters, and they'd sent them red letters, and they'd sent them invoices, and they'd sent them big rude things saying they were going to be taken to court, and nothing happened. So they started to look at social bias and social behaviors. And they said, OK, everyone likes to be like everybody else. So what happens if we send them a letter that says, 86% um, of people in your area pay their taxes on time? And that means that you have schools and roads. Awesome. Go be one of them. And they tried another one that said, did you know that in your street, there's only two people who haven't paid their taxes this year? And they tried all these different experiments. And in the first week, they raised 15.3 million in unpaid taxes because people didn't want to be the one that didn't pay for the roads and schools. So it worked better than all those letters, and it saved them a stack in sending out letters, too. They did another one, too. They were finding that people weren't opening letters. I don't know if you do this. I, I, I do, too. It's like if a letter comes from the bank, I put it over there, and I, I deal with it some other time when I'm feeling stronger, or late at night over a glass of wine or something like that. And it happens less, because less comes by paper. But I always used to not open my bank statements, because I couldn't face it. So what they did was they said, OK, they employed some students, and they got them to hand write in red text on the front, Bob, open this letter. It's really important. They increased their letter opening rate by 25% in the first two weeks because it had something personal in the front of it. So 
both of those things are simple actions that someone can take. Something was designed that was real, it was about someone's behavior, and I could take one simple action to resolve it. There was another project in the UK where they looked at um, washing machines, and they said, okay, it's not in the interest of, we have all these dead washing machines, everybody has a washing machine, they get thrown out all the time, how do we help people? And the average age of an appliance has gone down. So, so we replace things now every six years, not every 10 or 15 years. How could we incent washing machine makers to make appliances that last longer? Because they've got the technology to do it. So what happens if instead of buying a washing machine, you buy a washing service? And Bosch or whatever supply you with a washing machine. And you pay them a very low cost to have this washing machine. And when it dies, they replace it. So you're effectively entering into a contract with them not to have a washing machine, but to have clean clothes. And what that means is it's in their interest to make a washing machine that lasts as long as it possibly can, because they don't have to replace it if it works well. And if they actually make it cheaper for you and it uses less water, then it's also going to make it easy for you to wash well. So what they did was they incented the behavior and made it easy for people to act differently, and they made it easier for companies to act on the technology that they already had. There was another one that's done with power. So there's starting to be some interesting stuff around electricity saving. So there's some work done in, in, in the US where they um, identified that if, you, if, if you're two people, and I have a reward to give you, and I say, be fit, walk 10Ks every day. If I give you money to make him walk, he's going to be twice as successful, and he's going to do it much longer than if I give you the money to make you walk. So then they looked at electricity, and they said, well, what if electricity companies were incented to just provide heat instead of providing electricity or heating? Their job was to find the cheapest way to maintain your house at 27 degrees all year round. So if you live next to a big factory, they might get extra heat from the factory. If you live in an area with, heavy, with good wind, they might put in wind power. It doesn't matter the solution. It's their job as a technology company to solve the problem. It's your job to enter into a contract to just have a thing. And this is a perfect example of what I mean about actions. So instead of saying, I know what this is, this is going to lead to, I, I deal with a lot of these things Tell me how much, how, tell me what this product's going to do. It's going to save 5% laps. Really? How? How is somebody going to do something differently? So we've been going into those. We're talking a lot about action metrics and saying, it's all very well to say this is going to do this. Unless I can actually prove how it will happen in this site, with this button, in this workflow, in this retail store, then I can't claim that metric. It's really tough because it's really hard to claim something like that. And it makes you think in different ways. And it makes you diff about different ways about the way people do things. So it might not be about saying, we need five pages. It might be about saying, the sole purpose of this page is to get somebody to fill in all the fields at once. How will we know when it's done? Because they've pressed that. And then you can start to have conversations that are really true about the success of the design of something. Because at the end of the first week, if you wanted 36 people to finish that form in less than five seconds and they haven't, then you know there's something wrong. So, it's, it's been an interesting path. It's, we we're not there yet at all. But. And the other thing that we've learned that's really important is that it's actually not about the thing. It's about the space in between the thing. So a lot of journey mapping has been going on in big organizations. PwC is doing journey mapping. Um, Deloitte's are doing journey mapping. Every man and his dog's doing journey mapping. It's great. It defines the stages in a journey. But what we've been starting to understand is that the stages of the journey are not good enough because people don't do things in linear patterns and they don't do things in linear ways. What actually happens is, for example, web chat. We do some web chat service. And our agents use web chat um, and they have to deal with three conversations at once. The trouble is that of those three conversations that they're having on web chat at the same time, they're all operating at a different cadence. So someone might be feeding the kids, doing some shoe shopping. And their conversation's kind of going with, can you help me with my health insurance? Ooh, nice shoes. Yeah, yep, I'll get you sandwiches in a minute. And so that's a sort of like a slow lagging conversation. Somebody else is in there and they're like, okay, I want to talk about my health insurance now. Get on, with the, get on with the show. Only we kick people out after five minutes. So the person having this sort of slow meandering conversation gets kicked out and then they have to come back in. And we do put them back onto the same person and we don't lose their data or anything. But it's still a kind of weird thing that happens. And the reason that happens is because it's not about the conversation. It's about the connection points in the conversation. People talk about omnichannel, which is a horrible word. But what they mean is actually that what we need to do is to get someone from web to mobile or mobile to store. And that bit is not about the interaction, because I'm going to have an interaction on web, and then I'm going to have an interaction on mobile. 
The really important bit is designing that bit that happens that moves me from one to the other. And we often forget about those. We assume those will happen rather than design them. Love this. This is a um, um, weightless project. So it's an initiative that was started in the, in the US. And they said, what if we actually, we've got all these Fitbits that people are wearing. We've got all of these trackers and bits and pieces tracking how many calories people use. What if we tied donors to the use of um, people's exercise? So for every calorie you burn, we donate X amount of money to food charities. And it's become a hub through which people use their data to effect a change. And it's been hugely um, successful. I think it's up to 300 and something billion now. And it's been hugely successful because it's a purpose-driven change. I have data. You have money. I believe in some change. I'm going to make a change to me so that they get something better, and you're going to help me do that. It's Again, it's around that value exchange. I think we, we need to start thinking about valuable exchanges, not about sites. We, we've moved beyond things being important in their own right. They are. It's important to have a well-designed site. It's important to have a well-designed app. But what is the purpose of what it's doing, and why is it doing it? So I, I, I do extra steps because my Fitbit's tied to this, not because I, and I, I feel good about it. I, oh, I walk up the stairs with all these bags. I guess some kid in Africa is going to get more food. Now, it's probably not quite as simple as that, and I'm sure there's all sorts of cynical reasons about why that wouldn't happen exactly. But lots of other people think this is a good idea, too. And that's, I think, what happens when we start to use our data, the true, the Fitbit data that we actually have, with the real. I can track and contribute my stuff to your site, into the ideal. I can actually change the world. So we've had a lot of conversations around um, the features of something or the, the things that have to happen. Often we start off in, in, in the design process. Somebody says, oh, we need a thing. We need a, we need a, a thing to help people go to the gym. And then we start to design what features that's going to have. It needs to have a sign-up page. It needs to do this. It needs to let people pay money. But then we have to start talking about the product job. What is this going to do? It's actually going to help us help people go to the gym in different ways. That's kind of cool. I can buy into that. But what if it actually changed my behavior? And that's the step we often don't go to, because we hit this one, and we go, done. It's going to be amazing. People are going to love it. It's going to be awesome. But we forget to have that conversation that says, how does this change meaning? So what Guevara have done and what Weightless Project have done is they took what's effectively a web service and they looked at how it might change the world. And then they looked at how those things connect and where the overlap was and what the core was. And that thinking is the stuff that I mean when I'm talking about design thinking. So I guess the purpose bit's easy. I think. Think about the things that matter to you. They're not things like paying your bills, making sure that the um, spreadsheets balance. They're not um, making sure that you can get the right kind of vegetables at the supermarket on a Friday night. They're much, they're much bigger than that. They're how do I keep my kids healthy? How do I become a better person? How do I not suck at doing my task lists? How do I not forget about that appointment that I said I'd do and then have to ring someone and go, I'm really, really sorry, I'm not there. Um, and that purpose bit is the human bit, and we all have that. And whether you're a, a scientist, a dev, a legal person, a risk person, a designer, a whatever, we all have purpose, and that's the first part that you can come together and share meaning. Then you have your user needs. And again, just to think about the how and the why and what someone's really trying to do. If you say someone is trying to fill in a form, take it back a level, go back up and go, hang on, is the purpose my purpose in the world to fill forms? Yeah, no. I'd like it not to have a form at all. Then the business needs, and we can't forget those. It needs to make this much money. And a lot of time, I have a lot of designers that I, I work with who see the perfect beauty in a design problem, but have forgotten how to see the beauty in a business problem. And, and business problems are interesting and, and exciting and, and just as exciting as any design problem. How do I make someone do and change their behavior so that this will happen? And these people will be happy and give us enough money to do more of this. It's just a design problem. Except that because that's their world and that's our world, we forget that that's interesting. And what I find is if I take designers on a journey with me around this business problem is really cool, then we start to get really, really cool things happening. Because designers get business. Everyone gets business. It's just a way of making something happen to change something to make something else happen. 
but we forget to frame it in the right way as an interesting problem or an interesting challenge. We start thinking of it as something we have to do for those annoying people. And then there's the core. Of this thing, I want to do this great, amazing, world-changing thing. What are the few things it absolutely has to have? And then can I get in? And can I get out? And then the magic happens. If you just think about those things, and you have the courage to sit in the mess and the, the, the chaos of that space, then magic does happen. But it takes real courage, and it takes you to own the questioning of that problem. And often, we see that problem, but we perhaps think it's not appropriate to ask it. Or we're concerned that someone's going to think we're fluffy if we ask that question. And I think for each of us in every team that you work in, how do you create that environment for your team that allows people to have that messy space and ask those questions? And obviously it has to have a stop and a go, but, but if you do it, great things happen. So I would say there's a lot of conversation and whinging goes on. And my community is the worst of it all. Oh. Everyone understood design, the world would be an amazing place. You know, oh, if stupid people would stop doing stupid things like this, then we wouldn't have to do that. We all have it. And we whinge about our clients, we whinge about the other people we have to work with, we whinge about that really grumpy person in compliance who's stopping me doing what I want to do. And, and, and we, we actually have a, a, um, a, a small punching spot in the corner of the design area, which is like for those kind of like <coughs> moments, because we all have them. But the fact is, it's our responsibility and our courage to move beyond them. And if we can't solve that problem, then the questions we're asking are the wrong questions, the stories we're telling are the wrong stories, and the engagement we're having is the wrong engagement. So often what we'll do is we'll have a meltdown with someone or a stakeholder, and we'll come back and we'll go, we'll go, like, oh, that person's never going to let us do something. They go, hang on, this is a design problem. How do we get that person to think that this idea of ours is their idea and really great? And that changes the way we work, because it then gets people to stop being quite so grumpy and it actually gets them focused around problem solutions. So it might be the story we've told isn't good enough. We haven't told the right story to the right people. We actually gave the wrong message to those people and they think we're building a thing, but we're actually building a triangle thing. And what we have to do is get them back online. And it's allowed us to look at the way we manage our stakeholders instead of whinging about everybody else, which doesn't mean there is one person that I actually am on a mission to kill. Um, and, and he is now in the, <laughs> he's, he's so far in my dark corner that he may never get out again. But that's okay. I'm dealing with that. He, he'll, he'll die quietly and painfully at some point in the future. But, uh, or I, I will. And my team said to me yesterday, you know you're going to have to get over this. And I was like, yeah, I know. So I would say it's up to us to do this and to apply this and to come to it and to ask the right questions and be part of a community that's doing these things because then we can really do amazing stuff. And the skill that you bring to build and create great stuff, and the skill that a great designer will bring to suggest the way that someone might use that stuff, and the skill that a great organization might bring to apply that and make a problem that makes money is a really kind of fun thing to be part of. So that's kind of all I got to say, really. I had to have London in here because I've just come back from um, a year in London. Um, and I guess I'm open to any questions, any answers, I'm always open to a coffee, although it's been a bit busy the last six months. But um, yeah, have a chat, find me, talk to me, talk about interesting things. I think we've got time for a couple of questions, so yeah? Yeah, of course. You mentioned at the beginning bringing people together with designers and generating insights. Uh, one of the problems I run up against is the box principle. You get some people, some people are stuck outside the box. You might be designing for a hardware shop and you pick up a hammer in front of the group and they've all got blank faces because they've never been in the shop, they've never used a the product, they don't know anything about it. Or you get the other people who are stuck inside the box. As soon as you say hardware, or in synchronisation, they all pull out an iPhone and ask Siri, what is hardware? <laughs> and they're all, you know, they're all going to think the same. So how do you actually shake them up and get the, the so, so it's a whole, it's a good question, a whole range of things. So, so we have this um, program running at the moment with our, our leadership team and we're sending out the general managers and executive general managers and lots of organisations do this. We're sending them out to our stores and our call centres, but we're sending them out with a postcard and the post, because we, we know if we just send them out there, they'll come back and they'll say, oh, you know, my area of business performance is doing really well because everyone worked really hard. And they go, of course they did because you were there. 
Um, so we're setting them up with a little postcard, and it's asking them to um, first of all have to draw a sketch of, of the, the processes that they've seen, and we're giving them a prize for the worst and best sketch. Uh, we can't draw. We're going, well, these people say that they can't do what you're saying either, so go, go be uncomfortable. We're asking them to take photographs of the staff room, the worst bit of the store, and the best bit of the store. We're asking them to look at the staff desks, because when you look at the desk of somebody who works in a store, you start to see where the problems lie. So our desks in our, in our retail stores have lots and lots of paper around them because it's hard to remember all the things that we have to talk about. And we're asking them to turn up with cake. And we're asking them to, um, at the end of it, they have to do an interview with the store staff, have to interview them on video about their experience in the store. So what we're asking them to do is to go out and experience it. But we're asking them to do it in a way that puts them outside of their comfort zone. And, and you can do this in, in, in all sorts of ways. I mean, you can just send somebody out to go buy a hammer or if it's a hammer shop. You know, go, go buy a hammer and try and hammer. So, well, this is really bad. It's not, not working for me, you know? <laughs> so just getting somebody to do something rather than think something sometimes is, is really important. We'll go on walking meetings sometimes, and we'll just go and walk around an area, and we'll look for things that are stupid. Um, we're like, well, why does the escalator go that way? Because everyone's going to walk that way to get... Uh, that's weird. And, and so just remembering to put yourself back in context. We sent some guys out the other day to look at what happened at tram stops, and they were like, yeah, well, people get on and off the tram. I go, no, no, more happens at a tram stop than that. So we got them to go out and sit at a tram stop and watch for a bit, and we got them to focus on what people were carrying, what they were doing, what they did when they got to the tram stop, how they worked, and they came back, they were like, oh my god, I never realized so much happened at a tram stop. So it's really just about getting people to stop and reframe. Um, I saw one company that's employing poets as their um, experience designers, because they said poets and creatives see things in different ways. And when we send a business person out to somewhere to go and do observation, they come back with business framed observation. When we send a poet out, they come back and go, oh my god, the blue thing over there was really weird. Um, and loads of people didn't sit on the blue thing because they didn't like it. And, and they'll tell us stuff about emotion. So it's really, I think, about creating the opportunity for people to step outside their box and be, be comfortable. And that's what we try and design in. I mean, it's not always easy to think about it, but, but, but it is possible. Thank you, oh, That was a very long answer. I hope that was... I thought it was a good answer. Did you like that answer? <laughs> Any other questions? Firstly, thanks. That was brilliant. Um, oh, good. There's a lot of parallels and overlap in the way you're approaching your design with behaviour-driven development yes. movement in, um, like, development design, as in business, um, software design, and I'm just wondering if you'd want to talk about that or ask, you know, like, see, does that fit in with the bigger picture that mm. you have there? Absolutely. So, so I think behaviour change and, and beha behavioural economics are really key drivers, in particularly in health and finance. And, and so much of what we do, we use um, the, I don't know if any of you know the BJ Fogg model around behaviour change. So he's a Stanford design professor and he's developed a really simple behaviour change matrix, um, which talks about motivation, opportunity and trigger. Um, and that if you don't have all of those things in the design of an interaction, then you're unlikely to get a behaviour change. So when we design our minimal viable actions, we talk about if we want someone to do this, how are they motivated to do it? Um, what is the opportunity for them to take that? Can they find the thing on the page? And what's the trigger for them to do it? So the trigger might start way back in, in, in the type of um, SEO information we have available. The trigger might start in a Facebook page. But unless we consider that motivation opportunity trigger, then we can't really design effective um, interactions for customers. We also, the, um, the BJ Fogg model is quite interesting because it, it shows, it design, defines behaviors into things like span behaviors, spot behaviors, or continual behaviors. So do we want someone to do this just once? Do we want them to do it regularly every week? Or do we want them to do it over a period of time? So we find that model quite useful just in, in framing up what we're trying to do. So for something like, Health insurance, which is kind of effectively a grudge purchase, how do you encourage someone to continue to engage with that? That's a span behaviour. We need to, to start to build in those. So, yeah, we're doing a lot of work, and we do a lot of... Um, uh, my team's fascinated. We, I've got one behavioural designer in my team, and, and we continually scan the environment to sort of find out what people are doing. And I think that's what interests us about things like Carrot and Weightless Org, that they are behaviourally driven projects that happen to be expressed in digital formats. So, yeah... How do we get you and your team involved helping us make decisions around UX in Drupal Core and Drupal <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> I'd be really happy. Like, we're always happy to do a workshop, um, and, and certainly like we're happy to do stuff. I, I, one of my biggest coaching lessons this year has been don't say yes to everything, because my kids, my kids started to get to the point where they were like, who is this mass woman? Um, but my team, one of the things that we do try and do is support communities, because for us, the, the more people work like this, the better it is for us because the better stuff we do. So we're always happy to run a, a session or a, a workshop or a, support a hackathon or, you know, whatever you've got on, like, by all means, keep in touch and, and we'll do what we can to help. You'll be sorry you said that. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of us around in Melbourne. It's quite a strong design community, so we can always kind of, like, put, put people in. Thanks, Harriet. Any, I think we've still got some time for some questions. So I see one there, one there. Any others? Just put your hands up so I can kind of maybe... <laughs> Good. All right, a couple over there. Any women want to ask a question? I'd like to hear. Yeah, there's not no, that many women here, are there? <laughs> <All right. laughs> Cheers. Just uh, continuing from um, that previous question, um, I suppose as an aspiring sort of user and customer experience designer, um, myself coming out of Yay. programming <laughs> and into, into this space, uh, what advice do you have for sort of training, um, formal learning and study options, and uh, potentially your background and how you got into the area? <laughs> My background's a bit random, but um, there is some good stuff. So in terms of training, there's General Assembly are doing some really good UX training in Melbourne at the moment. Um, they have a whole pro range of programs, um, and they have a really good industry mentoring. Um, people like Heath Wallace run a, uh, a series of sessions around UX training and development. Um, but I would say the, the biggest thing is, is, is to be continually curious, to sort of go spend time sitting on, on tram stops and trying to understand why people do things. And there's a lot of stuff on the web. I mean, UX Australia um, is, is one of the big conferences that's held annually. It sells out quite rapidly, but it's usually a really good curated, really well curated program of, of um, experience design type events. My background was it's kind of weird. I was a teacher, and then I was a multimedia developer, and then I became interested in why we had interfaces, and it was really early days for UX. So in those days, there were no jobs for UX. Um, and so a lot of us who had backgrounds across everything from behavior design, learning and development, um, HCI, got together and started to build a community. So I think 2009 was the first UX conference here in, in Australia. Um, and then, for me, it was a pathway through service design, through that into service design. And, and it's always been, my, my father's an industrial designer. And I grew up in a household where I would come down in the morning, there'd be 10 kettles. And I'd go to make a cup of tea, and I'd, he'd go, why did you choose that one? And I'd go, oh. <laughs> man, I don't know. Because it was near my hand. No, 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 there must have been a reason. So I kind of grew up in that environment. That, and that's what I mean about being naturally curious. Watch why people do things. You know, when you use something, think about why the button's there. What annoys you about it? And, and it's that training that we, we call it industrialising curiosity. So when I recruit for my team, I can teach UX skills, but I can't teach curiosity. So I just employed a really young girl who's a graphic designer. And I employed her because she came into the interview and I said, talk, talk to me about um, uh, some stuff you've done recently. And she said, oh, I redesigned this toy site. And I said, oh, yeah, OK. And I said, she, I said, how'd it go? And she said, well, I tried this, but people were really against it because it didn't look like they wanted it to look. And I said, what did you do then? So she goes, well, I took them all to Myers. And I showed them all the toys and where, I, where ours would sit and why the colors wouldn't work. And I got them to do things. And they came back and said, yes. And I was like, OK, I want you. Because I can't. I, I can, she, she comes with a set of graphic design skills. What I can't build is that natural curiosity about why people do things and how they might do things. She talked about another thing she did where she worked with a not-for-profit community, and she'd realized that she didn't understand what it was that they were trying to do, and that was why she was struggling with the design. And so she went out and sat in some meetings and listened to what they did, and then came back and went, get it. So I, I would say nurture that curiosity. I'd, I'd say go and chat to people. Um, there's things in, in Melbourne. There's um, UX Movie Night. There's... Um, there's a whole bunch of different bits and pieces going on. So yeah, General Assembly, Heath Wallace, um, Huddle here, do, it's a service design company here in Melbourne. They have um, open evenings and, and they've just run a design week um, session. So there's some good stuff going on. Um, yeah, I, I'd sort of just get part of it and talk to people. But yeah, definitely look at some term training as well. And, and that spectrum of design. So are you interested in the behavioral and research side of it? Are you interested in the ethnographic side of it? Is it about designing better interfaces for people? Start to sort of work out where your, your design spectrum sits. That's sort of what I would say. 
<laughs> a girl question, yeah. <laughs> this is probably a bit of a oh, oh, to the left type of question, but um, I come from a family which has got um, people in it with dyslexia and autism mm -hmm. spectrum. So I'm always thinking about those people and their different ways of thinking and their different ways of integrating information and reading information and stuff. And I just wonder, are you conscious of that mm -hmm. in any of the work that you do? And how do you keep yourself conscious and reactive? So we have to, I mean, we have to, we have to comply with um, the usual W3C. Um, accessibility guidelines, which have become, I think, stronger over the years. I think they've become much more about facilitating information exchange rather than just making sure the code's right. Um, a lot of it is about getting people to consider. So, so I, I mean, I'm lucky enough to be in a company that's quite got quite a strong diversity um, uh, policy and approach. So it's quite easy to have a conversation around diversity. Um, also, because I work in a health area, we have to make our stuff accessible. Also, it's about having the right people in the room. I find learning and development people are really good to have in a design space because they'll often talk about how to effectively exchange information. Um, I spend a lot of time working with people who aren't designers because they teach me an awful lot about different things. Change people teach me about how to get people's behavior to change. Desi uh, learning people teach me about good ways to structure content. Um, so, so yeah, we, we definitely are considerate. We don't always win the argument, but often we do. And some of it becomes, can, might come down to, we just can't use a visual-only treatment for this, or we can, or we have to have a different idea. I think we're, we're helped by some of the legislation that's come in recently to support us. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a part I'm deeply interested in. 